everyone, welcome. Uh, it is the top of the hour, so we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Bailey. I will be your host for today's session, um, which is called From Problem to Prevention, Evidence-Based Public Health. Since some of you might be first-time attendees at an NNLM webinar, I do want to briefly discuss our organization and int introduce it to you. Um, the Network of the National Library of Medicine, also known as NNLM, is part of the National Library of Medicine, which is within the National Institutes of Health. We are the education and outreach arm of the National Library of Medicine. We work regionally, getting to know communities on the ground and helping those communities serve the people that they know best. But we are definitely present across the entire country and work to advance the health and well-being of everyone through access and understanding of how to use health information. This includes working with organizations like libraries of all types, schools, healthcare workers, uh, and community-based organizations. We do this primarily through three different methods. One, providing funding to organizations so that they can work with their own communities. Two, other forms of outreach and engagement. And then three, like today, we do offer a wide range of training and education opportunities. Let me quickly go over what we'll be covering today so that everyone here has a sense of the shape of this presentation. By the end of the session, you should be able to describe the three domains of influence, list the seven steps involved in evidence-based public health framework, use the PICO framework to develop a research question, and apply search filters to find high-quality research from at least two online resources. I really hope this will be an interactive class, so um, like I mentioned, please be prepared to type some responses into the chat. Um, I really look forward to hearing, um, hearing from y'all and your expertise. So I'm going to start us off with a question, and I'd love for you to all respond in the chat. What do you think of when you hear public health? What activities constitute public health? Public health? So please share those responses in the chat, and I will pause just a moment um, to give a chance for responses to roll in. Okay, thank you for those responding. Prevention, um, vaccination, epidemiology, prevention at the population level. Yes, thank you. Community involve, involvement in health, that's a really important one. Um, a focus on social determinants of health and how they may impact health outcomes, that's definitely central to it. Um, anything that, it, that concerns community health, great point. Um, education health updates, public safety, health of human populations. Uh, I can see all of these are really great, great responses. Uh, and as you can see, there's a lot of different ways to answer this question because public health includes a broad array of topics and a lot of areas of intervention and prevention. Um, and a lot of these are interrelated. The American Public Health Association uses the definition that you can see here on this slide. Public health promotes and protects the health of people in the communities where they live, learn, work, and play. That's pretty broad, um, but then again, as we see from our own answers that are still coming in in the chat, so is public health. Public health is pretty broad. Uh, one of the nice things about this definition is that it recognizes that public health is for the health of people and also for the health of communities. We can see the broad nature of what public health does through the examples provided by the CDC's 10 great public health achievements of the 21st century. These achievements cover everything from immunizations and infectious disease prevention to childhood lead poisoning and motor vehicle safety. All of this work falls under public health promoting and protecting health for people and communities and has been credited with adding 25 years to the life expectancy of people in the U.S. over the span of the last century. And while it's really important to celebrate the achievements in expanding uh, life expectancies, we know that life expectancy, expectancies still aren't equal, whether your frame of reference is global or local. 
you may have heard the statement that your zip code plays a bigger role in your health than your genetic code. And you can see some of the evidence of that here. Let's look at the, these graphics um, on the slide that were created with a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation tool called What Makes a Long Life? Look, at your zip, look to your zip code. Um, sorry, I'm going to say that title again. That was unclear. It's called What Makes a Long Life? Look to your zip code. We have a, a link to that tool um, in the handout that will be shared. Uh, the top number for each of these addresses is really what we want to look at here. The top number, number represents the life expectancy based on the two different addresses in the same zip code. The graphic on the left side of, um, of the slide here shows a life expectancy of 82.5 years. And on the right side, the life expectancy is uh, almost 75 years. This is an eight-year difference between two neighborhoods that are less than two miles apart. So as a public health-minded professional, you might be asking yourself, why is this the case? What is creating this inequity in health? And what evidence can we use to investigate these questions? There are two main categories of factors that contribute to health inequity. The first is what's known as structural inequities. These are systems of power, like racism, sexism, or xenophobia, that create disadvantages among groups of people compared with others. The second is what's known as the social determinants of health. These are conditions in which people live, learn, work, and age. Things like access to healthy food, safe drinking water, transportation, education, and safe housing. These are not issues that can easily be separated, and structural inequities often underpin social determinants of health. Many public health conferences, requests for proposals for grants, and publications ask public health professionals to look for ways to address stru structural inequities and social determinants of health as a larger call for health equity. So what can we do with this information? How can we start to achieve health equity? That's a really big question. One way is to take action using an evidence-based public health approach. Considering structural inequities and, uh, sorry, considering structural inequities in the planning phases of evidence-based interventions and programs. Using an evidence-based approach to public health lets us approach the broad challenges of health equity and structural inequities through systematic evidence-based interventions. So there are a few definitions out there for evidence-based public health, and I just want to note, you may hear me also say EBPH, and throughout this presentation, that's going to stand for evidence-based public health. So there are a few definitions for EBPH out there, but in general, it can be thought of as the development, implementation, and evaluation of effective programs and policies in public health through application of principles of scientific reasoning. So let's just focus on one piece of this definition on the slide here, and that's the effective programs and policies. This is a key aspect of EBPH, but how do you know if something is an effective program or policy? This definition doesn't provide a framework for how we can make decisions about which programs and policies will be the most effective. So how do we choose what the best policies what the best policies and programs are based on scientific reasoning? One way to answer these questions is to look at different domains that influence evidence-based decision making. And I'll do that here in just a moment. But before we go into the how of EBPH, I want to make sure I don't neglect the why. This could be useful not just to convince you, but if you end up being in a position of convincing others employers or grant funders, etc., of the value of spending time and resources on doing this type of research. Evidence-based public health practices allow us to do this, the things that you see here on this slide. Access more and higher quality information on what works, have a higher likelihood of implementing a successful program. If we know what's worked somewhere else, we can better demonstrate um, the evidence as to why it would work in our community too. It allows us to uh, see greater workforce productivity. 
Again, we're putting resources toward programs that have demonstrated success already, allowing us to build on successes instead of reinventing the wheel. And um, it's, it's a more efficient use of public and private resources. Building on successful programs, making more cost-effective choices, these are always appealing to folks who are concerned about the bottom line. Um, and before we move on, I just want to give you a, a quick example of the importance of EBPH. So many of you are probably familiar with the, the program DARE, or Drug Abuse Resistance Education. Maybe you went through it when you were a kid, or you had kids or neighbors that, that went through it, and you saw folks wearing the shirts. Um, D.A.R.E. is a program that has been widely used in U.S. schools. Uh, research found that it costs about $750 million on an annual basis to implement the program. But multiple studies and systematic reviews have been conducted and have found that the D.A.R.E. program has either no or a negligible impact on preventing substance abuse among children and adolescents. So if you're thinking about a substance abuse prevention program, DARE may not be the best intervention for getting the results you want. And it also lacks cost effectiveness. So if you go through uh, an evidence-based public health framework to research that before deciding to implement it, you would uncover those, those truths. Um, we've included a link to in the handout to the article that this information about DARE is from. So here's another uh, quick plug for the importance of evidence-based public health. For those of you who are in settings that may be looking at public health accreditation or who support these organizations and institutions, I wanted to mention that evidence-based public health practices are part of Domain 9 of the Accreditation Standards and Measures. Institutions that are seeking accredita accreditation must adhere to these standards, so it may be another reason why you'd want to integrate more evidence-based practices into your daily work. Um, again, we do have a link to those standards in the handout. So how then do we get to the point of figuring out which interventions, programs, and policies are likely to be the most effective? We can determine effective programs by doing our due diligence and examining the best available research evidence. So we need to do three main things. We must understand the current community and political landscape. What does the community need? Programs and interventions will not be successful if they're not addressing a need in the community. What's realistic with the funding and politics of the community? And what's the community backing for the program? We must also consider the experience, knowledge, and expertise of personnel. What are the resources that are available in your organization and through your stakeholders to support this program? It's important to be realistic about the experience, knowledge, and expertise you have at your disposal. And we must investigate the best available research evidence. This is what we're going to be focusing on today. To make informed decisions on development, implementation, and evaluation of interventions, programs, or policies, we're looking to balance these factors. Based on the best available research, what does our community need? Uh, and and do we have the money and experience, expertise, and knowledge to implement? Thinking through these domains of influence can help you be more confident in the decision-making process, especially if it's combined with a tool like a logic model to help keep track of goals, outcomes, and inputs, like funding and expertise. So as promised, now let's dive into how EBPH is practiced. There are different frameworks out there, of course, but one of the most commonly applied frameworks is from Brownson and colleagues and covers seven steps, which I'll cover here briefly, and then go into more detail on some of them as we move through the session. So the first step uh, is here at the top, and that step is community assessment. Uh, so going out and understanding what's actually happening in the community and assessing the needs for resources, interventions, and overall health needs. That's what's included in community assessment. Next step is to quantify the issue. Here you're going out and identifying sources of existing data related to the issue or problem that you're likely to address. The third step here is to de develop a concise statement of the issue. At this stage, you're clearly articulating the problem in an effort to build support for the issue. 
The key, the key components of an issue statement uh, include the health condition or risk factor being considered, the populations affected, the size and scope of the problem, prevention opportunities, and potential stakeholders. The fourth step is searching the scientific literature. This step involves a comprehensive search of effective interventions on your topic to determine what has or has not worked in the past. Next comes prioritization. At this stage, you're looking at what options are on the table and evaluating what works for your community. Although you can see some of, the, some of those domains of influence that we just talked about on the first, uh, in the first three steps, um, especially step one, the community assessment, steps four and five are where they really come into play. Looking at scientific literature and prioritizing programming, um, programming op options here. How do you prioritize these options? By looking at the scientific literature and at the resources your community has available to, real, to realistically address the health issue. The sixth step involves the nitty-gritty work of action plan development and actually implementing the intervention. And then the final step is to evaluate the program and hopefully share the results with a broader community to help build a continued base of shared knowledge. One interjection I do want to make here is um, to encourage you to publish your findings where possible. How do we continue to bolster scientific research? By sharing what we've learned successes and barriers, what worked and what didn't. So the next organization looking to try similar intervention finds even more quality research to support their work. The process of evidence-based practice is not really linear, but a continuing cycle or a loop because public health interventions and programs should be evaluated on an ongoing basis. We should continue to monitor the health status of the population and making mid-course corrections and adjustments to the program and, interve and interventions as needed. So we just went through these seven steps here, but today we're really going to focus on step four, um, determining what is known through the scientific literature. Specifically, we'll look at developing a question that will return usable and relevant results and then introduce you to some resources that can help you find literature and judge the quality of your results. So you might or might not have heard of the PICO framework before. This is one of the most widely used frameworks in the health sciences to guide development of research questions that can be used for the basis of searching literature data databases and similar. Using PICO is a way to translate a situation of interest into a formal research question and structure the development of your search queries. PICO is an acronym. P stands for patient or population, or you can see here on the slide also problem. Essentially, P um, asks who is being studied and what condition we're looking at. I stands for intervention or what's being done to treat the patient or population. C stands for comparison. What are we comparing that intervention to? This is often simply a control group that does not receive the intervention. So that's why control is listed under C as well. And then O stands for outcome. How are we measuring the effects of the intervention and comparison? So I do want to acknowledge that sometimes you will see a T at the end of PICO and that, um, that brings time or time frame into the equation as well. So let me go through a brief example, and then I'll ask for help in constructing a different research question um, for a scenario we'll use in our examples through the rest of the class. So our situation is this. Several elementary school children in your city have recently contracted measles. You've learned that caregivers of the children were concerned about the safety of vaccinations and had not vaccinated their children. You wanted to increase the likelihood that this group would vaccinate their children, so you plan to implement a school-based educational campaign. But you want to find evidence of the efficacy of similar programs first. In this case, the population in question, P, is elementary school children. And we want to measure the outcome, O, of vaccination rate, uh, uh, if their caregivers do or do not uh, receive school-based vaccination education. 
Oh, so sorry, folks. Um, so let's fill in these blanks uh, to write a research question. So we have this on the handout too, if you want to reference that. Does a school-based vaccination education campaign for caregivers increase the rate of vaccination among elementary school children compared to students whose caregivers did not receive the educational campaign? This is a good time to mention that once you've identified the PICO elements of your research question, you might want to spend some time thinking creatively about how you might search for these concepts in a database. So for example, you might not want to search only for educational campaign, but rather for things like informational materials or email campaign, campaign um, vaccination information, informational flyers, and so on. If time allows, being more thorough with your search terms will yield the best search results. So now let's move on to another example scenario. Let's say your community has seen a decrease in cancer screenings in multilingual, refugee, and immigrant communities. You want to create a community health worker program to increase those rates. Your community does not have any programs targeting this effort currently, so you need to come up with evidence that putting forth effort and money into the program will be effective. In this scenario, you can see that you've already done the community assessment and observed a decrease in cancer screenings in refugee and immigrant communities. You found the need and quantified it using other resources, which is steps one and three in the EBPH process. When we have a scenario like this, one of the first things we should do is translate it into a research question. We want to be able to ask and answer a question in order to bring back quality information that's also useful and relevant to our situation. And of course, we can do this using the PICO framework. So let's take that scenario and identify the PICO elements. Please type into the checkbox any one of the PICO components from this scenario. And I'm going to pause here and wait for some responses. Thank you. Yes, intervention would be a community health worker program. Um, the population is multilingual refugees and immigrants. And we see another population refugee and immigrant communities. Yes, multilingual is a good thing to include there since that's part of our question. Um, outcome uh, rates of, of cancer screening. Yes. Thank you very much, everyone. So from our scenario, we know that the population and problem are decreased rates of cancer screenings in multilingual refugee and immigrant communities. Our intervention is a community health worker program, like you mentioned here in the chat. Uh, we don't have any comparison because we're not comparing to any existing program. Remember, our community doesn't have a program like this. And our outcome is an increase in cancer screening, again, among multilingual immigrant and refugee communities. Essentially, we're pulling out key pieces of information, and then we can take this and put it into a question. Those key pieces of information will then also guide us as we uh, guide what we enter into our resources, like literature databases or other sources of reliable data, as search terms when we run our searches. So once we pull out key pieces of information, we can formulate a research question. You can see here we've added um, the parts of PICO that apply to each question in parentheses and bold. So you can see that I um, stands for intervention, O is outcome, P is population. You do have some flexibility here to word this sentence in different ways. So the way that I've put this, this uh, research question together may not be exactly the way that you would word it uh, in your own search. Um, but in this case, since the comparison piece isn't really doing anything, we just didn't even put that. So a uh, PICO is still at play, but there's just no comparison portion. Once we have a researchable question, we can begin searching the literature to find evidence that will help answer this question. So I have two questions for you, um, and I will pause again after I ask you these questions for some responses in the chat. So the first question is, if this was your research question, how would you start searching? Um, and so kind of an extension on that question is what databases would you use? Search engines, other resources? Um, there's not a wrong answer here. Um, I'm just asking you to share 
what's the first place that comes to mind uh, when you think about asking this research question? PubMed, so much PubMed, I love to see it. I see PMC, PubMed Central. Okay, wonderful. Thank you everyone for your responses. I, there was a, a bit of a flood of PubMed at the beginning, but then we started getting some different responses. So um, I think that's, you know, a, a great testament to the fact that we all come from different places, um, you know, and maybe working on different types of projects. And so that will really kind of drive where we look for um, answers to this research question. So like I mentioned though, like there's no one right way to start your search. What's really important is um, to use multiple resources and looking for high quality evidence, research, and data. So what do I mean by high quality research? That's kind of a loaded, uh, a loaded term, so let's break that down a little bit. Um, before we talk about some of the places you can go to search for literature to find evidence of successful interventions, I do want to quickly talk about the hierarchy of evidence. This might be familiar to some of you, but it's really important to review when we're talking about finding evidence-based research. So the hierarchy of evidence reflects the relative authority of literature. This is often depicted in a pyramid format like you see here on this slide, um, where the base of the pyramid includes study formats with the lowest quality of evidence and the top of the pyramid with the highest quality of evidence. And when I say quality of evidence, what I'm referring to is the range of bias or opportunity for a study to have systematic errors. For example, anecdotal or opinions and editorials can have a significant level of bias based on the author and their experience. And I'm not saying that every anecdote is wrong or that every editorial is unreliable. I'm merely acknowledging that they have a higher likelihood of error than things higher up on the pyramid and generally shouldn't be relied upon as evidence. On the other hand, randomized control trials or systematic reviews control for bias through prescribed study designs and represent the highest level of evidence. It's important to note that public health evidence may not be available within some of the top level categories of evidence. Researchers uh, have pointed to the fact that unlike in clinical medicine, um, public health evidence often comes from cross-sectional studies rather than, so -called, than the so-called gold standard of randomized controlled trials. Still, there are more systematic reviews being published within the public health literature, and as noted earlier in this presentation, um, successful evidence-based public health relies on the best available evidence. Essentially, you want to find that the literature that's as high up on this pyramid as you can. And while this evidence pyramid is focused on literature, we're also going to be showing you some reliable sources of data today. Once we understand the relative quality of evidence in terms of types of studies to look for, um, we can then start the process of going out and looking to see if there is high quality information that addresses our research question. I'm going to pause for a drink just a moment, folks. All right, so um, the next portion of this session is going to be a live demo. So I am going to open this here. Uh, so let's start by talking about PubMed. That was the first response um, of, to many of you when you when we when I asked the question about where would you start looking for um, looking to answer this research question. So um, for those who are less familiar, PubMed is a free database from the National Library of Medicine, and it contains 34 million citations to articles from more than 5,000 health-focused journals. To demonstrate PubMed, um, we're going to take our scenario, and I'll type three terms from our PICO question in the search box. So before I do that, I do want to acknowledge that um, you can see in the address bar that there's this really long URL for PubMed. But if you want to access PubMed, you can just type in pubmed.gov and it'll take you there. So anyway, let's start our, let's start our search um, by typing in three terms from our PICO question. So let's type in immigrant, cancer screening, and community health workers. So you can see here, I didn't use any modifiers for the search, no quotation marks, ands, ors, et cetera. If you're comfortable with using those modifiers, you can certainly modify your search, but 
PubMed does not need that um, for a basic search to produce meaningful and useful results. So for this search without any filters, we get 50 results. But it's important to also think about synonym searching or other terms we could have used in our PICO question. For example, replacing immigrant for refugee. In this search string, it brings back eight results. And then using the term multilingual gives us three results. Um, so let's go back to our original search. I'm just going to go back twice here. Uh, we can already see by some of the titles here that the results aren't exactly what we're looking for if we're looking to use community health workers in the United States to promote cancer screening. Um, so because we can see some international studies here. Uh, some of the results also look um, for CHWs to do preliminary screenings. Um, so let's narrow down our search. Thinking back to our hierarchy of evidence, we can use the filters on the left-hand side here to filter by article type for the highest level of evidence. So I'm going to click um, three different things in the article type here. Um, the page is going to refresh every time, so please bear with me. Um, so we're going to be looking for randomized control trials, systematic reviews, and meta-analyses. So these filters, filters help us to narrow down our search to six results. So I think one that's very relevant to us today is this article here, Economic Evaluation of a Community Health Worker-Led Health Literacy Intervention to Promote Cancer Screening Among Korean American Women. Before I click on that page, I do want to point out one useful feature of PubMed is you can limit your search to results for free full text, and that's this filter here at the top. This is really great if you don't have a lot of institutional subscription access to journals, so you can at least get started with some articles that you know you'll be able to read the full text of for free. Um, so you'll notice the first article here also says free PMC article. This means that it's on PubMed Central or PubMed's repository for free full text articles. Um, so I'm going to go back and click on this article that we selected earlier. Um, so I'm going to show you the article page here, uh, and I'm going to be doing a little bit of scrolling. Um, so this page is going to show me an abstract and some other information about the article, as well as provide links to full text. So you can see full text links, um, and here they are right here. The article page also includes links to similar articles. So that's right here. There's um, a list of similar articles to the one that we selected and also um, includes a list of places that this article has been cited. If you recall earlier, I mentioned it's a good thing to think about alternative search terms you may want to include in your search. So without going too much into this, which would really be a topic for a more advanced searching class, um, one way to get started on this is to scroll down to the section here that says mesh terms. These are the subject areas that articles um, are indexed by in PubMed. So if you click on these, you can explore some of the syn synonymous or similar terms that PubMed associates with them. So let me head back to the Pu PubMed main page and show you one more thing. So under you scroll down a little bit and under find, you see clinical queries. PubMed clinical queries is a tool that can be found on the PubMed homepage. This tool is meant to be a time saver to find good answers to clinical questions so that you don't have to sort through as much literature or do a lot of your own filtering and um, search strategy building. So simply type your search terms into the search bar here, and you'll be able to view results in a few categories, including therapy and diagnosis and etiology and so on. You can see those here in this drop-down box. These results will typically be systematic reviews, uh, clinical trials, or other high-quality evidence. 
So while many of you, as demonstrated in the chat earlier, may already be familiar with PubMed and have used it for other purposes, these next two resources are great places, great places to find synthesized, evidence-based public health information. I'll be demonstrating these resources using the same scenario and highlight filters and features that may help you. So the second resource that we're going to highlight today is Health Evidence. This site comes from McMaster University, located in Ontario. Health Evidence provides access to more than 8,000 quality-rated systematic reviews specifically focused on effectiveness and cost-effectiveness of public health interventions. According to their search strategy page, the Health Evidence team runs monthly searches on seven bibliographic databases to find appropriate quality resources. To date, more than 1.6 million titles have been screened, so it's really comprehensive. You can run a simple search from the home page, uh, but the advanced search capabilities of Health Evidence are quick and easy to build searches. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit. Um, you see the simple search bar here, but we're going to click on Advanced Search and play around with that a little bit. When you go to Advanced Search, you're provided a number of search boxes here at the top to type in your keywords and use Boolean operators like AND and OR, which you can see in these drop-down boxes, drop-down menus. Um, this is pretty similar to standard advanced search tools in other literature databases. But what I really like about this search tool are the additional filters, and those are located when you scroll down a little bit. Um, for those fields, you can see that we can use predetermined key terms to narrow our search. So back to our PICO question, um, I can build my search using the drop-down menus without anything in the text fields above. So let's try that. I'm not going to type anything here. I'm only going to use these um, drop-down menus. So for topic area, I'm going to choose go to chronic diseases and choose cancer. And I do want to highlight if I just choose cancer, which is a subcategory of chronic diseases, it only selects cancer. If I choose chronic diseases, it, it selects all of these here. So um, I'm going to only select cancer. Um, the population of this, this research question is really important that we're talking about, but I'm actually going to leave the population um, box blank here because there's no option for immigrant or refugee, but I, I will um, just show what populations they do have listed here. And then uh, lastly, for intervention strategy, let's choose a few things. Let's do um, behavior modification, education, awareness, and skill development and then screening. Those are all relevant to our question. So now that we have all of that selected, let's go ahead and click search. So with these parameters, we get back 451 results, as you can see here. Um, but this, this search that we just did with only the drop-down menus, it's missing key parts of our, our PICO question. So um, sometimes you'll have to run multiple searches um, multiple times with different parameters. Sometimes the parameters are varied just by a little tiny bit, um, but that can really help to get back use, useful results. So let's go back um, and try to get some, some results that we can play with. So this time I will type community health worker into the search box here at the top. Um, I'm going to go back and do topic area cancer again. And then let's go to intervention strategy, um, education awareness and skill development, and screening. So now when I search that, it comes back with 11 results. Uh, so these results kind of give us an idea of the kinds of information that health evidence this resource provides. You can see title, authors, and date, um, but then you also have this column on the right called a rating. Uh, this is the rating column. All reviews have been assessed for methodological quality by two independent reviewers using 10 quality criteria. A final review quality rating for each review is assigned. So there's three categories. There's strong, moderate, and weak. A strong review quality would be scored an 8 to 10 out of 10. Moderate quality would be 5 to 7 out of 10, and weak would be 1 to 4 out of 10. You'll also notice that some of these articles, one that you can see here on this page, um, have icons indicating their content or use. So if you hover over the icons, 
um, health evidence provides a brief description of what that icon means. So for example here, the green dollar sign indicates that this report contains some information about intervention costs. So let's scroll down a little bit and select an interesting article down here, um, Outcomes of Community Health Worker Interventions. So we see the abstract here, and we see that there are links to the article here in the, in the top right. Um, and in many cases, the links go to PubMed, which is great. Um, we also have access to the quality assessment uh, to see where the article did well or well it, where it fell short based on the peer review. For this article, we also have a few symbols here, those icons that we were just talking about. So the caution sign shows that the article is more than 10 years old. This lightning bolt sign shows that the article is popular. And the scale icon uh, shows that this article includes information about economic evaluation. Also note, I'm going to scroll here to the bottom, um, the keywords here at the bottom uh, that include some of the filters that we initially turned on when we started our search. So when we think about applying the best available evidence we can using health evidence, um, like health evidence can help us find not only the studies that sit atop the health, of the health evidence pyramid, excuse me, but also the ones that are of the highest quality. Lastly, um, I'd love to demo the community guide. Uh, the community guide is a collection of evidence-based findings from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Community Prevention Service Task Force, which includes experts from a broad range of fields, such as community preventive services, public health, health promotion, and disease prevention. Findings are based on systematic reviews for effectiveness and economic evidence. This resource is focused on interventions and looks at their impact and cost of effectiveness when evidence is available. So you can search through this resource with a keyword similar to what we've used in the previous websites. So um, I'm going to type in keywords from our PICO question, immigrant, cancer screening, and community health worker. And click search. So as you can see here, we get 34 results. Um, we can quickly narrow the search to just systematic reviews by clicking on this tab here. And now we're only seeing three results. So one of these results is specifically about cervical cancer, so we're going to choose that one here. Um, this one's about breast cancer, this is about cervical cancer, and this is about colorectal. So I'm going to choose the one about cervical cancer. Clicking on the result, we are presented with a snapshot of the intervention that's being reviewed. Under the What the CPSTF Found tab, we get a brief but thorough summary of the context, results, economic evidence, applicability, and gaps. And I'll, I'll scroll through that so that you all can see that. It's just a single snaps, snapshot page here. Um, and then you also can see this other tab here, Considerations for Implementation, uh, and that provides additional evidence found that may be important when implementing an intervention. You'll notice on the left-hand side, this is very useful, that the, interven the intervention is recommended strong evidence. The Community Guide is a really great resource that quickly allows public health workers to find quality reviews of population health interventions. So I know I've demoed these three things kind of rapid fire, and I want to pause in case anyone has questions about any of these three resources. Okay, um, is there citation info on the community guide? Um, let's see here. Let's explore that together. Um, so considerations for implementation is what we were just on. Um, let's go to support, supporting materials. Um, so this can be really helpful when looking at um, what, was you, what frameworks were used. There's an evidence table, and again, I apologize for scrolling and try to be um, conscientious of that that's kind of difficult to look at some, sometime. Um, here are some included studies in this review uh, and some additional materials. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, there's also plenty more to explore here, so please feel free to do that. Um, but yeah, uh, we can also see that... Uh, 
uh, one user wasn't aware of a, couple of a couple of these resources, that's really wonderful. Um, where can we find information about what is indexed in the Health Evidence and Community Guide? Emily, uh, thank you for that question. Unfortunately, that's really beyond the scope of uh, what my knowledge is of this resource at this time. If anyone else has, has a response to that, please feel free to type it into the chat. Um, I know that we have a lot of experts here in the room, um, so I, I appreciate um, any support that y'all could offer. Um, Bailey, I might pull in, I don't know if David Brown, who joined us, um, has information about that. And I wonder if, um, is, there, is there an about section? Um, where can we find about what, you know, what is indexed in here? Um, you know, where do they pull that in from? So I don't know. There's an about us. Let's see. Yeah, maybe FAQs. I don't know. Oh, here, what about research? It talks about that. So there is this section here under About Us about updating health evidence um, and how they do that. There's also a link to their health evidence quality assessment tool, which is something that we highlighted a little bit earlier. And also, yeah, and then Astrid kind of pushed a little more about if she wanted to cite the review. And I don't know, you know, PubMed does have that, you know, a nice little button, <laughs> cite this, you know, uh, um, article, but I, I, I'm not seeing that here, um, but you may have to build your own citation. Yeah, I agree. There... I, I don't see here um, where specifically you, it's just a citation button, but here's the citation here listed at the top. Oh, yeah. Well, I think that would be what you'd need, Astrid, possibly. Okay, there you go. She's happy. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your, for your help, Rebecca. Um, okay, so let's go back to uh, our presentation. The demo part is over. You don't have to see me scroll through web pages anymore. Um, thank you for your patience and thank you for interacting. Um, these are some really great resources, uh, so, but that's not all that's out there, of course. So I want to round out the session with a couple more resources that I'm not going to demo, but I'll just tell you about them. And the links are available on the handout, um, and a link to the handout was put into the chat earlier. Uh, Campbell Collaboration is an international social science research network that produces high quality, open, and policy relevant evidence synthesis plain language summaries, and policy briefs. It does not have too many health-specific examples, but it may offer additional context when working with other departments and disciplines to develop programming. Uh, and finally, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this resource, County Health Rankings. County Health Rankings is a database of county health statistics and provides a way to quantify the health and health needs of communities and compare them to other counties that are geographically close or demographically similar. County Health Rankings also has a section on interventions and policies that have shown promise, um, which is especially relevant to this presentation today. So it is organized similar to the last uh, resource that I demoed, the Community Guide. So just to recap, evidence-based public health, or EBPH, involves an evidence-based decision-making process that looks at the best available research focusing on community needs, and incorporating your own personal expertise. There's a seven-step process that evidence-based public health follows, starting with community assessments, moving through searching the literature, and then finishing with evaluation. And as we've demonstrated here, there are numerous resources out there to help guide you through this process, including the three that were live demoed today, PubMed, Health Evidence, and the Community Guide. This concludes today's webinar on evidence-based public health. Your, your health department may be a member of the NNLM Public Health Digital Library, which supports your use of evidence-based resources. The NNLM Public Health Digital Library provides access to over 375 e-journals, e-books, 
and databases for its members. Use the link on the handout to see if your organization is a member. Uh, if you are, reach out to your administrator and you can get a login. Thank you everyone for attending the session today and we hope to see you at a future webinar. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.